Well, greetings and welcome to another episode of Lightbulb Moments. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out past Lightbulb Moments. Also, this is a podcast. So many of you are probably listening to this not live, but this is the live recording and uh, we're super thrilled you're with us today. I'm Tom Kuhn. I'm host and curator of Lightbulb Moments. And I can humbly say that Lightbulb Moments along with Money 02 by Aaron, have been not uh, nominated as Podcasts of the Year. So this is for Aaron's Money 02. Probably hasn't happened before, a father-daughter with two separate podcasts. So anyway, it's not too late to vote uh, for your favorite podcast, which, humbly spoken, I think you should vote for mine, uh, Lightbulb Moments. So definitely check it out, Hairbrained uh, Awards. Um, what is a lightbulb moment? Well, for me, it's a moment of sudden realization, enlightenment, or inspiration. But uh, you can't start a fire without a spark. So hopefully you get some sparks today that will start a fire of action. Um, this whole podcast was really built during the pandemic, uh, where we realized there was an opportunity for hope, but not just hope, but action. At CUNITY, we're here to take what's confusing, overwhelming, and complicated to a simpler path towards prosperity. And remember to prosper, remember to manage your ATM, the three currencies we have in life, attention, time, and money. And thank you for spending your precious time with us today. We love hearing from you. Send us a note. Or if you want to be a guest or you want to nominate a guest or just have a light bulb moment of your own, let us know. Our guest today is Jen Lyles, Executive Director of Beauty Schools Marketing Group. Jen has some fascinating stories, and she's in a very, very relevant space to anybody in the professional beauty industry because she helps schools um, grow their population and grow the workforce. So super excited to have Jen with us. Uh, also, she's got some fascinating stories. Um, she's an award-winning marketing and communications professional. More about her background a little bit later. And then as a bonus, as a bonus, we have another guest with us today, which is why this is going to be two episodes. Tamara Fields from Accenture. Uh, she's the office, uh, the Austin, Texas office managing director as well as the entire South Market Unit, Director of Operations. Tamara was going to be our guest uh, next week, and um, she ended up having a conflict. So uh, we're fortunate she, able to, she was able to join us today, which is also significant because we're going to time that around some announcements. We have two very dynamic guests today for those that are with, uh, with us live. Um, otherwise, these will be put into two separate podcasts because both of them are going to be awesome. Submit a light bulb moment you own on our website. Uh, the podcast is proudly sponsored by Lightheart Sanders, CPA firm, Green Circle Salons, and Forest. So thanks for them helping to sponsor these episodes. Speaking of episodes, there's some great recent episodes. Our last episode was two weeks ago with Cash Lawless, um, the founder of the Million Air, I'm sorry, Millionaire Hairstylist. And Joining us with Cash was his partner, Jordan uh, Drake, is a last minute addition. It was a great session with Cash and Jordan. Check it, out, check it out. We also recently had Shane Price, the CEO and founder of Green Circle Salons, as well as Liz and Jess, Aaron Dell from Luscious & Co. So we got some great recent episodes to check out. Upcoming dates, of course, we have the fill coming up uh, May 19th through 21st in Austin, Texas at the AT&T Conference Center. Um, and we also have on the night preceding the fill, we have a celebration of light bulb moments on the evening of May 19th. This is going to be a very, very special event. It's going to be a night to remember. Uh, all of my previous guests of light bulb moments are receive a personal invitation to join us. Uh, the whole idea of this celebration of light bulb moments initially was to create an opportunity for me to honor, not just me, but our entire community and the entire industry to honor those that gave their precious time by being a guest on this podcast. And we have some special surprises for this evening. So a couple of big events coming in May. Also coming up, we have One Day, One Ticket, One Million uh, with Beauty Changes Lives. We've talked about this about every single week. Uh, it's not too late to sign up for this initiative, uh, which actually teaches philanthropy to your staff and helps a very, very important cause, Beauty Changes Lives, of which I'm on the board of. Here's a QR code. I'm going to keep it up here for a moment for those of you that are seeing this either on YouTube or live. Um, and if you go here, this is where you'll get all the information. 
reminder about uh, Aaron's podcast, Money O2. And then here's the image that actually has both of our podcasts being nominated. So uh, if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and vote. Uh, I guess voting closes March 3rd. Uh, hopefully you'll vote for Aaron or my podcast because um, uh, we, we, we humbly enjoy what we do and we love having as many listeners as possible. My light bulb moment this week, my light bulb moment this week, I've got a couple of them. First of all, uh, I am pleased to announce, and this just went out on social probably five minutes ago, uh, our theme uh, of the conference, the third annual fill. And the theme is LEAP. And LEAP, we have some wonderful imagery that really uh, represents um, the idea of taking the leap. Uh, and what do we mean by leap? You know, usually it means a bold or significant decision of action involving a de de degree of risk or uncertainty, but it's moving forward with courage and decisiveness, stepping out of one's comfort zone, embracing change and new opportunities. So it's a willingness to confront challenges and fears and embrace the unknown in the pursuit of growth. Uh, we'll use our time together with the Phil to do a deep dive into the five most common gaps in our business, looking at transformative solutions. And it is a leap year. Tomorrow is leap day. And what a perfect time to make this announcement. Early bird pricing for the Phil, and we will sell out this year, um, especially due to some other announcements I'm going to make in just a minute here. So um, early bird pricing still exists. Now, the other thing, and this is a good segue into uh, Tamra, who I'll get to in a moment here. Um, this is not fully public yet. We like to have some of these things announced with our light bulb moments before it goes live, but uh, we will be announcing a significant collaboration with the University of Texas McCombs School of Business, uh, as well as um, the Humans Dimensions organization, which is another branch within the university. Now, just to give you an idea of the caliber of education that we're going to have at the Phil this year, we are going to be bringing in uh, some world-class faculty members, as well as world-class graduates, including Tamara, who we're going to meet in a moment here. Um, and um, we have multiple, multiple professors, executives, but the one common denominator is they're all affiliated with the University of Texas at Austin. This is unprecedented for the beauty industry. Uh, it's a fully curated partnership uh, where we are gonna be bringing in some of their best speakers, professors, and we've been working on this, oh, for probably maybe seven months. Um, official announcements will go out later this week, or probably be a press release. Uh, and a little bit more about the university, um, which the core values of the Texas education, executive education at the McComb School of Business, who our primary partnership was with, um, is uh, one of the most preeminent business schools in North America. Uh, it's known for innovative programs, as well as partnerships with distinguished corporations. I guess we're a distinguished corporation. Um, consistently ranked among the top 20 graduate schools in the world and ranks number one in the best professors category, which means we have the best of some of the best professors. So I am so thrilled about this. Um, our programs are custom built in collaboration with both these uh, parts of the university. And I cannot tell you how excited I am. Tamara, why don't we have you uh, come on camera here and come off a of mute, and we'll get a chance to meet you. Uh, Tamara is uh, one of the speakers going to be joining us. And um, so let's make sure, Tamara, we got you here. All right, Tamara. Yes, I am coming on. Very excited to be with you today. There you are. How are you today? I'm doing quite well. How are you? I'm so glad you're able to join us this week. I was looking forward to next week, but um, you know, you're with us early and the timing's perfect because we are just about at the finish line with all the final details with Macomb. And, uh, but we met you separately and JP from our team discovered you, uh, had a conversation and said, Tom, you're gonna love this woman. And we, uh, we chatted last week and I said, Oh my God, in the first three minutes, I thought, this woman's a powerhouse. How are you today? 
I'm doing quite well. And I have to say, this is a great way for me to start is uh, hearing these compliments. It's great for one's uh, belief in oneself, which I think is is awesome because we all suffer sometimes from a, a little imposter syndrome. So thank you for that very warm welcome. Well, I think I think if someone reads your bio, they would never use the word imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> and, you know, some of the things I want to highlight is uh, you have a big job. I mean, you're not just part of Accenture, which is a world-class consulting firm. Um, you're the managing director of the office, um, yeah. South Market Unit uh, Director of Operations, 13 states. Wow. And you're a graduate from the Red McComb School of Business, um, and you also serve on the advisory board. Um, and you've won all these awards like Austin Chamber of Commerce, Greater Austin Business Award for Executive Leadership, and you're called a power player. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, at the end of the day, um, it's about what is your passion and what do you do to serve, right? I be, believe very much in servant leadership, and I'm thankful that others acknowledge that point um, for the contributions that I've made. But I, I really think it's about how are we showing up each and every day to serve others? And all of us do that in whatever role that we are in. And we have to do that with passion, and we have to do that with caring, and we have to do that with a sense of self and a sense of self-respect for others. Mm. You know, there's a lot of topics we could explore, uh, yeah. but there's one that just kind of blew me away and it has to do with um, your involvement in conferences <laughs> and then a study that came out. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about uh, that, if that's all right with you. Absolutely. I mean, you know, very young in my career, I started in information technology consulting business. And when I first started in my career, right, one of the things I noticed that there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. And so I had to find other mechanisms and aspects for um, encouragement, for growth, right, for mentorship. And I just needed sometimes others to deposit in me uh, who might have my my unique considerations. And, and, and that's not to say that I wasn't working in an inclusive environment or a welcoming environment because I was. And some of my best um, sponsors and mentors over the years have been men. But I also wanted to have a female perspective because there were things that I needed to figure out even about my life and children and all these things that I was just trying to contemplate. And conferences started to fill that gap for me. I went to a couple of conferences that really helped crystallize my thinking. It made me think that I wasn't alone. It made me realize the importance of hearing other voices and gaining other perspectives um, to, to incorporate into my own. And, and that was critical, I think, in terms of the shifting in my career and how it started to move up, right? And, and it taught me how to have my voice. It taught me how to advocate for myself. Uh, and it just became critical. And as a result of that, because of the impact it had on my life, I desired that I wanted to give back through the same way, which is why now also um, I'm a big proponent of conferences, speaking at conferences, um, and I support many of them. I've initiated several of them, and I serve on the board of one of the largest conferences here in Texas as well. You sent this article and it's by Sean Aker, Aker Harvard Business Review. Yes. And it was, it was about moving the needle and conferences. And uh, the author goes on to say he, you know, sat next to someone that was quite cynical on a plane ride about, you know, a waste of time going to a conference. And then that led to certain studies that kind of blew me away in terms of outcomes that have happened after attending conferences, financial outcomes, intellectual outcomes, kind of blew me away. Let's speak to that a little bit. The article you sent me. No, absolutely. I mean, what has been found, and, and I'll have to find the exact statistic here that I'm um, looking at, right, is that, and maybe you have it there, Tom, right, is that women who attend conferences are two times more likely to either get a, a pay raise or three times more likely to uh, get a promotion. And I might have those slip, I'll have to check in just a second. But the point is that at the end of the day, if, if a woman is attending a conference because they gain so much knowledge, understanding, um, expansion of their own voice, right? Um, they see immediate results. And this has been proven um, statistically that they actually improve their ability to get to the next level and or make more money, which I think we can all celebrate together. Said in the year after connecting with peers at a conference, the likelihood of receiving a promotion doubled. Wow. 
Yeah. Uh, and 78% felt that re uh, reported feeling more optimistic about future after conference and all these other outcomes um, and sense of social connection, engaging sessions, memorable moments and very interesting. So that's one of the many things you do is, is you know, support different conferences like you'll support ours, but also speaking to how that makes a difference especially for members of communities that we all deeply care about. Yes, I think I think we underestimate the importance of connection. We also underestimate the importance of mentorship and sponsorship. And often, um, and I and 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 there have been studies for this as well, right? Around um, you know, women from a societal uh, social perspective don't always know how to advocate and don't over, and don't always feel empowered to advocate for themselves and to represent their voice, right? It's not always considered ladylike or appropriate. So how do you do that in a way that you feel authentic? And I think what these conferences do is it gives you permission. And you wouldn't think that you need permission sometimes, but sometimes you do. And then the second thing it does is it gives you um, tactics for how to go have these conversations. And if you're feeling uncomfortable and you're feeling insecure, having um, confirmation from others and tactics on how to go have a conversation about, I really do think I'm the right person for this job. And let me tell you why. Um, you know, let me um, explain to you some of the things that I've contributed. Um, at the Texas Conference for Women that I'm a board member for that we did in the fall, we had a speaker, Jamila Jamili, and many of you might know this individual, um, very well known, right? And she made a statement that I thought was so uh, important. If you looked on my LinkedIn, you'll see the quote, right? And it's that um, men are hired on their potential and women are hired on what they have done. And it goes back to that concept of, okay, it's not just about the work I've completed today. It's about the potential of what I could do. And I have to have the opportunity to do that. I need the ability to translate my skills into this new opportunity. And I need you to give me that opportunity. And let me show you why I think our skills matter, even if every single role and every single aspect of my skill base isn't 100% matched for the job. And I think having these conversations are, are essential. I also think it's important always, you know, it's been proven that women negotiate less for a new role or a new job. Um, and so having confidence around understanding your worth and understanding and having the research of what a particular job should be offering, are, these are things we need to understand and know how to talk to. Mm. Very, very powerful. You know, also, I want to I want to shift a little bit when we're talking to you about our theme, um, which you just heard a little bit about, we announced our overall theme, but the theme of the fill and you had some profound reactions when I described to you what our event is. You know, it's about filling your bucket, getting away from the business and filling fill in the gaps. And um, I, uh, we were talking last week and I, I just, I, I didn't have the record button on. And it was like, JP, you got to get this stuff down. You were just like on a roll. And you had some really cool thoughts when you, when we talked about our theme, the fill and your point of view. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to share this. You know, I think as women, one of the things we've been talking about lately, lately is the invisible workload. And when I talk about the invisible workload, and, and you'll hear more about this because I have an entire point of view around this, right? But the invisible workload is more than just a job you do every day. It's the job you do at home. It's the kids you take care of, right? It's the partners that we have, um, that we have to take care of. It's the parents that we have to take care of, right? It's the fact that you might have the full burden of responsibility to plan everything, get all the clothes, get everything together, right? And, and, and so as a result, you're just busy. You're busy from when you wake up to the morning to when you lay your head at night and your mind is circling with every activity and action you have to do. It's doing it at work, it's doing it at home. And so the reality is, you get you got pushed to the background and you don't have an opportunity to take care of yourself and when your tank is not full other people have impacts because you're not able to bring your full self your full patience your full love your full awesomeness of who you are forward because you're tired and you're empty and so i love this concept of filling your tank because i think that these conferences provide an opportunity for you to take a moment in time, whether it's one day or two days, 
for you to concentrate on you. And in doing that, you're refilling your tank. And I believe we need these moments to refill our tank because we need it for our emotional wellness, our physical wellness, and our spiritual wellness so that we are in the best posture to serve everyone in our community and around us that we have so much passion and love for that we want to serve. It allows you to do that in a way that you can feel satisfied with yourself because you yourself are filled. And I just think it's really important that we take these moments in time to do that. We can't do that every day. Let's be realistic. We can't always do that every week. But we can definitely take these moments to do a conference that allow us to fill our minds, fill our hearts, fill our spirits. And I think they're essential to our emotional wellness. Wow. Uh, And, you know, I, I think many of us understood right after you said the phrase invisible workload but um, am I the only one that hasn't heard that actual phrase? I mean, put in the chat button there. I mean, may, maybe maybe that phrase has been out there a long time, but the invisible workload, I mean, that really is a very profound descriptor that speaks a lot. So put in the chat. I mean, am I, am I the only one or, or a lot of other people hearing that, that mix of three words like that uh, for the first time? Uh, what what are some of the things you do in your in your role at Accenture? Um, Absolutely. I mean, I could tell you um, I've been in the consulting business for for two decades plus in my current role. I'm, I'm the COO of our South region. And so I have accountability to our sales, profit and revenue. I have accountability to new business sales and maintaining and optimizing our co- optimizing our costs for our people, uh, management of our people and making sure that we have the right resourcing at the right time to fulfill the needs of our clients. And I think all of us can relate to how do we keep those customers and our clients happy? Right. And so. Um, You know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to measure all of that because it it takes a lot to keep humans happy. (laughs) Uh, It takes a lot, especially in my world, because we're a services industry. And so anybody that's been in the services industry understands that you have to keep the people uh, happy who are providing the serving. And at the same time, you got to keep those who you are serving happy. And those two do not always want to correlate and work together, depending on all the factors that you're, you're working with. So, you know, each and every day, it's about how do we show up um, to provide our best um, to our clients? And that means having the right tools, having um, the right resources, having the right training, um, making sure that um, we have the right mix of teams, right? Um, and, and making sure that those teams are working together in a high performing way um, and, and, and putting them together to make sure that we are always at the center of our world are our clients, right? Uh, we have a thing called 360 degree value. How are we serving our clients from every aspect of how they need to show up and how we need to show up to serve them? And so understanding their pain points, understanding what they care about, understanding what good looks like for them, and how do we match our tools and our resources and our people um, to accomplish that goal. So a lot of my time is around how to put together opportunities and deals that will fulfill that need for our clients and how to make sure that our people are in a position and in a posture to provide those services. You know, Accenture is... I mean, you're dealing with some of the best and brightest uh, when it comes from staff. Um, And you're also dealing with, you know, blue chip clients here. Um, I imagine there's a few egos that might, um, uh, um, you know, come out in these situations. How do you navigate at this level from a staff and client standpoint, given, you know, what level you're dealing with here? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I will tell you, I can answer it now. 15 years ago, I would have really struggled to answer this question because I think maturity comes wisdom, right? Years of experience, right? And you've had so many different experiences. It really does drive a different perspective. And what I can tell everyone out there, you need to have patience, patience for yourself and patience for your clients, because everyone feels the pressure of getting it done. And sometimes we forget that you've got to get out of your own head and put your your feet in somebody else's shoes. We hear that often, but often we don't do it. And really put your mindset in the other person's head and say, what is their perspective? What are they trying to achieve? What is so important to them? Sometimes we get so caught up in the discussion of what we're trying to do that we forget that we're all human. 
And at the end of being human is you have a desire, I have a desire. You're trying to accomplish something, so do I. Help me understand what's really important to you so that we can navigate this together so that we're both moving towards a win-win. And one of my negotiation classes that we had several years ago, and it was such a light bulb for me, that in a true positive negotiation on any circumstance, whether it's an employee to a client or an employer or a service provider to a client, whatever the situation is, there needs to be a win-win which means you need to achieve something and I need to achieve something. If you all win and I all lose, then actually we both lost. Because in that regard, right, someone is not going to bring their best because they didn't receive their best. And so patience is very key. And I have to tell everyone, patience was not given to me when I was born. Um, and so what has really helped is experience to back up, right? Take a moment, take a deep breath and say, I think that we're talking past each other. I need to better understand what's so important. All right. We're going to wrap up in just a moment. Tell us a little bit about your personal life. I understand you enjoy going to salons and spas. I do. I will tell you that um, I believe that it's important. I work really hard and I spend a lot of hours at work and I like working. So there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I very much believe in the importance of taking care of self. It was, it was just interesting. I was just at my doctor yesterday and she was talking to me about stress and the impact of stress on the body and how that leads to lack of sleep and how both of these have now been tied to early onset dementia. Mm. Really, really fascinating fact. And we were talking through this and, and she was talking about how she was really happy with my blood pressure results, right? Because I've been really working on how to be calm or how to relax. Well, how do I do that? Spas. Um, and don't worry, I have a hair appointment in a couple of days and I'm very excited to get my new hair, hairstyle, right? I believe in going for massages. I get one every two weeks. I get a massage without fail. Um, I like that spa experience. I like that relaxation experience. It helps me take a moment to step out of my head and say, it's okay for me to just have a couple of hours for me and help my body feel better, especially since I sent 10 hours at a day in front of a very small computer screen. Um, and I like to travel. So even when I travel, I make sure I include the spa experience. So I think that spas are exceptionally important to your, your well-being and how I reset. Hair is important to me because that's just part of me feeling good, right? Like part of my confidence comes to the outward. And it's not that that's what matters always, but it's part of how I put on my armor for how I go face the world and how I go face a, a new conversation. And it makes me feel good. And so that's something that I spend time and money on um, because I think it's important for me. Wonderful. I love it. Uh, I'm going to get a chance to meet you and meet you in person a week from Friday because I'm going to be down in Austin and your office is hosting something uh, that's related with South by Southwest. I can't yeah. wait to meet you in person. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, getting to really craft your contribution, we have you secured as a speaker. I'd like to have you there for the whole time, but that's another conversation. We'll probably have you at the beginning or the end. So I'm just glad everybody had a chance to get to know you briefly today. So let's everybody give uh, uh, her a, uh, a virtual round of applause here. Give her a little uh, note in the chat. Uh, I'd also like to award you the million dollar light bulb. Oh, um, it should be forthcoming to you which officially inducts you into our brain trust, which means you also are invited um, on a celebration of light bulb moments on um, May 19th. So, Excellent. I appreciate that so much. And I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to share my voice. It's really important and it's very much appreciated. Excellent. Looking forward to getting, you, uh, getting to know you more, Tamara. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome to stick around or if you have other things you need to do, that's fine too. All right, Jen. Let's bring Jen to the uh, uh, camera here. Wow, we have a couple of dy dynamos today. Jen, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. You know, your background, let me give you a little bit about your background. So uh, I already mentioned award-winning marketing and communication. Um, your primary focus these days are in school marketing and lead generation. Uh, you're the executive director of Beauty School Marketing Group. You can speak about what that means in a little bit. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, this topic is your, what you do is relevant to everybody because what you do is you help beauty schools grow their population and bring students into the industry. So, yeah. And I love it. I, someone asked me the other day, cause every time the lottery gets super high, I always play. 
And they're like, what would, would you quit your job? I'm like, no, I, I literally love my job so much. It's not about money. It's, it's not about, it's literally just about doing something I love every day. I never dread a Monday. I love going to work. You know, you've got a fascinating storyline related with game shows and uh, we talked about it and we did a prep call. Then I did a little research on you and sure enough, there you are on some of these big game shows. And, you know, you, you've been on two national game shows. Mm -hmm. You helped your husband get on two. Yeah. And the odds of getting on a game show is like crazy difficult. And you really relate it to marketing. So it may, it's not off topic. I think it's very much on topic. So Tell us a little bit about this whole game um, game show fascination you have and how you differentiated yourself from the competition to be on game shows and how you did. I love talking about this because I grew up in Canada and you can't be on American game shows when you're when you live in Canada. And I was like, I can't wait to move to America and live the American dream of going on game shows. Like that was my goal from the time I was a really small child. And so the first game show I was ever on was The Price is Right. And I, I do liken being on a game show to marketing because it's about knowing your audience. It's about doing research and knowing your audience. So for example, if you want to be on Jeopardy, having a big personality is not what they're looking for. They are looking for someone who is intelligent, someone who is quick and someone who is smart. Um, it's, it's the same way with Wheel of Fortune. They're looking for someone who can solve a puzzle. I knew that to get on the prices right, you just had to be stupid. Like you just had to like wear a dumb t-shirt, wear tennis shoes and have a big personality and so when you show up at the price is right, and it's only about 300 people, it's not a huge studio. It looks that way to us on TV, but it's small. And so as soon as I get there, I'm looking around at line and there are people wearing high heels, boots. And I'm like, well, you're not getting on. Well, you're not getting on. I mean, I could just eliminate half right there. So, you know, I wore the right shirt. I was jumping up and down in line where there are plants like producers in there. So the entire time you're in line, it's an audition. And so, you know, when my husband, he got on Ellen's game of games and he did very well, he went all the way to the end and won the most amount of money you could win on that show. And he had originally applied for, are you smarter than a fifth grader? They were um, bringing it back on network TV. Jeff Foxworthy was the original host. They were bringing it back and we don't have children. And, and, it, you know, he applied and through that first interview, they were like, you don't have kids. We want someone we know can interact well with children. Again, it's knowing your audience. And so they ended up pitching him for Ellen's game of games. So, you know, I liken it to marketing by saying, I don't care if you run a salon, if you run a school, if you run an accounting firm, know who your audience is, do the research on that demographic and, and make sure your message is reaching that person. You know, um, it's fascinating. Aaron, Aaron mentioned to me that um, she interviewed you, interviewed you on Money O2. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and um, definitely listeners should check that out. And we won't overlap, but you have a fascinating story in terms of your financial. You grew up with a poor family uh, and you, you have done some amazing things financially. So definitely check out the episode on that. We won't cover the same thing there other than to say that the story continues and you should check it out. Let's talk about marketing, which really is your jam here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in terms of bringing, uh, bringing people into the industry and what you're really seeing, um, you know, you talk a lot about Gen Z. So kind of give us some nuggets in terms of what's going on um, these days. Sure. So Gen Z are people born between 1997 and 2012. So they're roughly between 12 and 27 years old. These are the people who are choosing to go to school today. And they're different because they were born during a time where they were exposed to cell phones as children, as babies. Um, you know, the first iPhone came out in 2007. So a lot of these kids don't know life before technology. 
And so we do, you know, we, we were in high school with pagers, like we were doctors or something so ridiculous. Um, and, and kids today, they, they have Google at their fingertips. Um, they can see videos 24 seven, they're constantly entertained. And because of that, they have poor communication skills. They have a hard time looking people directly in the eye. They have a lot of anxiety. This is the most anxious and depressed generation in our history. And so if I, if I'm a business owner, if I'm a school owner, I need to pivot to meeting Gen Z where they're at instead of wanting them to meet me where I'm comfortable. For example, our admissions team, there is the old saying in admissions to smile and dial all day long. You're smiling and dialing prospects. They don't dial them. They don't want to talk on the phone. Um, yes, you should, you should attempt on the phone, but have a really, really smart, good texting strategy because that's how they like to communicate. When you are confirming appointments, tell them where to park. Gen Z doesn't show up to concerts or restaurants unless they know the parking situation, which means we have to literally tell them where to park. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are afraid to walk in the door. Why don't instead we send them a text that says, hey, when you get here, let me know you're here and I'll meet you out front so that they're not walking in alone. So I talk a lot about Gen Z because they're so different. And I hear a lot of schools complaining about it when really we just need to dive into why they are the way they are and meet them where they're at. I think what's fascinating that we, you and I spoke about was they don't want four-year degrees. Yeah. This and, is, you know, I, and there's, there's, there's so many, um, there, there's so much out there about a resurgence of the trades, you know? Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? What a great time for us to be in this industry. I read a stat the other day that said 64% of Gen Z that chose traditional college wishes they chose something else. Mm -hmm. And that 50% of current high school graduates are looking at something other than a four-year degree. And so what we saw over the past several years, and I, I'm, I used to work in a beauty school. So I'm a marketing, former marketing director for a chain beauty school. And back in like 2015, 2016, what we were seeing was a lot of millennials coming to beauty school after they chose college. So they're in a career they hate, they're miserable. And they're like, forget this. I only did this because my parents told me to, I'm going to choose beauty school now. And so we saw everyone shift their marketing budget, me included, um, when I was a director of marketing, we saw everyone shift their digital budgets to millennials and being like, we're a great plan B. Plan A didn't work out. Now we're a great place for you. Uh, when I was a marketing director, I pulled the stats and 78% of our student population had started somewhere else, like at a community college, even if it was just one semester. And so what happened was over the past several years, we started just dumping our high school strategies and putting it toward like second career strategies. That is a very poor decision today in 2024. The schools that are winning and will win this year are heavy getting back into high schools. Mm -hmm. So if I can offer any advice, it's to lower the age of, of who you're trying to reach. Um, and a hundred percent guys, we need to be back in our high schools with a really strong strategy. You also talked about um, yeah, um, kids with parents and parents still having schooled that and yeah. what that, you know, how that impacts students today. Sure. Look at Gen X, look at millennials who now have these kids that are in high school. A lot of people from our generation are still in student loan debt. They've been carrying student loans for 20 years. Um, a lot of them are in jobs that they hate. And these kids come home from school around a dinner table with miserable parents who are like barely making ends meet. And they're thinking, why would I do what you did? And that is really what Gen Z is doing is they're questioning everything. They're questioning why we treated the planet the way we treated the planet. They're questioning, well, well, why should I be driving a gas car? Should we be looking at electric cars? Well, should I be having four kids or should I maybe choose not to have kids? Like Gen Z is questioning everything everyone did before us because they have more access to information. 
and they're thinking for themselves. Their critical thinking is great. And so, yeah, they see their parents in debt. They see their parents at jobs they hate. They're like, why would I do that? Why would I go to a traditional school? So it really is a great time to be in the beauty school industry. Um, another stat I'll give you is that a lot of Gen Z, they are choosing jobs they love. So I read a stat last week that said 44% of Gen Z would rather be unemployed, unemployed than mm -hmm. at a job they hate. I mean, we have nearly half of them are like, I'll just not have a job. Wow. That is, that's crazy to me. And that tells me, especially if you're in the trades, we need to get passionate. We need to get excited and we need to show them that this is a career that people love and don't leave. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, that's a big statement, you know, that someone would be, um, rather be unemployed than being a job they don't like. I mean, that's right. wow. Um, uh, you know, you and I got into a topic and I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to go there with you, uh, with this group, but I would like to go there with this group. And, um, let's talk about TikTok a little bit here. Oh, let's talk about TikTok. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I was again, I was going to refrain from going there with you, but it's just too doggone fascinating not to uh, not to speak about. And you know, let's look at our audience. Our audience is primarily made of salon owners and managers and, and beauty executives and school um, leaders and a diverse group, but primarily employers. You know, mm -hmm. and um, so considering the audience, you know, um, and what that what that means actually to an employer too, let's talk about TikTok trends and what you're personally doing. Sure. So for starters, I will say th there's a couple different approaches to TikTok. If you don't know what TikTok is, it is a video only app that came out in 2018 and it, it became the most downloadable app in the world in the year 2020. Right around March and April when COVID hit, everyone was at home bored and needed a new form of entertainment. And so how TikTok works, I'll just give you a 15 second crash course, is you don't have to follow people to see content. It curates content for you. It literally is called a for you page. And so based on your age, where you live, your demographics, and the type of content you watch from beginning to end, they're going to serve you up more of that. So if you're really into home decor and you're watching home decor stuff, they're going to give you more of that. If there's a lot of people your age talking about something, they're going to give you that kind of content. So uh, we have Gen Z that are the most, they are the bit, the largest demographic right now on TikTok. And 51% of them are using TikTok as their primary search engine over Google, which is oh. insane. Um, they are, they're not even going to Google anymore, you guys. They're going to TikTok to search for things. So the re the number one reason they love it is because it's in video form. Um, actually, when when they asked those kids why they are going to TikTok to search, 69% said that it's because of videos. They want to see more video content. And so TikTok is great for several reasons, one for information, two for entertainment, and then three for monetization. And so you asked what I'm doing on TikTok, I'm delving into making money on there. And I'm making a lot of money on there. 85% um, of things being sold on TikTok shop today, which is essentially TikTok's version of Amazon. 85% um, of things being sold on there are in the health and beauty category. Wow. And so I don't even have to sell anything. I can just be a regular creator who bought a shirt on TikTok shop and talks about it. And every time someone purchases it with my link, I get a, I get a piece of that. I get commission. Well, and you don't sleep and um, is, is what you admitted. And so somehow you have turned this into a economic engine for you. And um, hold on here. Uh, I had a window pop up, excuse me there for a moment. So you're, you're out there just recommending products and yep. in, in a, in a way that's very authentic. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you're part of TikTok shop, you get these checks and these checks have started to add up to a lot of money. So so, and I, I did scroll through, I saw some of the things you're doing. It's super organic, super authentic. And yeah. Can we talk about numbers? Do you want me to, do you want me to share you, share with everyone the real deal with TikTok? Cause I think some people yeah. just think it's fake. You know sure. what I mean? Like this can't be real. 
Um, I am passionate about people making money because I grew, I grew up with not a lot of it. And I was a waitress at Cracker Barrel for seven years and had to pay cash for college. I was not born into money. My parents had saved $0 for me to go to college. My first car cost $1,500. And so I, I know how hard it is to make money. And I know how easy it is to make it on TikTok, which is why I'm screaming about it. It's also why I created a, a, a class now that 36 beauty schools are using. It is a one hour video workshop that teaches kids how to make money on TikTok shop. This month, I just checked this morning. So in the month of February, so far I've made $22,000 on TikTok shop off of maybe five videos that took me 30 seconds to make. Like it's, it's almost... I almost feel like I'm robbing someone like, no, there's no way it can be like, I just know the IRS is going to show up at my door. Um, but no, this is, this is legit money. This is real. I had to put in my tax information. I'm at 1099. Um, I'm putting money aside, obviously for taxes through my corporation, but it is easy to make money on there. Um, and it's something your students can do. And it's something that you can do again. I'm not, I'm not 20 something that's super savvy on, on the TikTok. I'm, you know, an elder millennial. I don't have a hundred thousand followers. I'm not an influencer and I'm making great money. I really think anyone can do this. Well, but if everyone could, if there has to be some investment of time and attention. And, you know, you, you mentioned your numbers from February and that, that isn't your first month you built up to this over time. How long have you been, have been working this? Brand new. I mean, I started in November with one video and I made a couple grand um, in November and December. Um, January, I think I only made one video and I made a thousand bucks. I made more videos in February. Uh, my niche I found was holiday sweatshirts. So um, February 1st hit and I knew in January I had my Valentine's Day sweatshirt that I bought on TikTok shop for 20 bucks. And I was like, I know I can sell this. I bet every woman will want it. And it, I mean, literally, like I had 2 million views on the video. Every time someone bought that sweatshirt, I got four bucks. So I, I think I made, it was like $12,000 in one week off of that one sweatshirt. And then naturally I'm like, okay, guys, what's the next holiday? It's St. Patrick's Day. So I just bought a St. Patrick's Day shirt. I did my videos and now that's making me money. And so you better believe I already ordered my Easter shirts. They're coming. So, uh, you know, I found my niche. Well, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, obviously our listeners are just kind of scratching their head. I mean, should I just hang up on this call right now and just join TikTok? shop and quit my day job and just start recommending health and beauty or holiday, you know, sweatshirts or whatever. A so, lot of people are doing that. Just so you know, a lot of people are quitting their, their nine to fives to do, to do it full-time influencing. Here's, here's what I will say to that. I don't know how long things will last. And as long as they do, I will make money on it. And for example, back in 2016, um, Airbnb was newer to the market. And my husband and I had this crazy idea that we would Airbnb our house every weekend to pay off our mortgage quickly. And we did, we turned our 30 year mortgage into four years. And we took our, the last two years of that four years, every weekend we would move out of our house. Um, and we, and people would rent our house on Airbnb and we live in Nashville. I mean, you know, we're a great destination that said, I, you couldn't do that today because there's so many laws and red tape now and insurance needed for Airbnb. And and we, and by the time we finished Airbnb in 2018, everyone was airbnb in their house. It's like you missed the boat. You should have got on early. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about TikTok. Mm -hmm. TikTok shop is new. We are in the first year of it. And so I'm making money for as long as I can make money there. But it you know, in three years, it might be something else. And I'm going to jump on that trend. That's how people make money in the world. They jump on, you know, when, when real estate's low, they buy, you know, mm -hmm. when the market's low, you're buying more. And, and I think I just got in at a really good time, uh, which is why I'm, I'm shouting it from the rooftops right now, get in. Cause right now is a good time. I think it's, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Jen, I could, uh, I, I could talk to you all day. And um, I am looking at the time here. 
And uh, you and I spoke earlier today about um, joining us in Austin. You accept this as an invitation to uh, uh, be part of Lightbulb Moment to the Phil at May 19th. We'd love to see you there. Love and it. Let's love everybody it. give Jen a virtual round of applause. I'm going to have you back as another a guest in the future. You also get a million dollar light bulb coming your way. Great. Makes you a member of the Brain Trust. So let's give her a virtual round of applause. All right. Jen, thanks again. And um, all right, all. Uh, this is going to be a wrap here. A couple just comments before we wrap up. Uh, certainly be um, looking at the fill. Uh, the dates are, we're going to sell out with the fill. And uh, especially given the amazing workshops that we're going to be announcing that um, uh, in partnership with the University of Texas and their executive education at the McComb School of Business, Humans Dimensions, and we'd love to see all of you there. Uh, we're on again next week. I will be doing my upcoming episodes uh, in March from another destination. I will be spending the month of March in Austin, Texas uh, for several different reasons, uh, not the least of which is this partnership with you, Texas. We have a data project going on and it's not such a bad thing to get out of Minnesota in the month of March. So we are bringing the dog down there and we have an Airbnb. Uh, and so I will have a new spot from which these light bulb moments are gonna be coming from. Uh, reminder again, thank you, our sponsors, Lightheart Sanders, Forest, and Green Circle. Um, another shout out to our guests, and thanks for listening in, and we'll see you all next week. Bye now.